Lovely. Thank you so much. And thank you for introducing several of our speakers today already. Uh, of course, they were introduced to me by you, and I, I owe you a great debt for that. It's led to some very delightful meetings and conversations and correspondence. So, and we are bang on time. Uh, so that's also excellent. <laughs> thank you very much indeed. Well, now we come on to what I'm calling topic one, uh, the vital importance of the Venetian lagoon. And I will briefly introduce Jane Domosto, who has recorded her talk. And in fact, I listened to it late last night, uh, a spellbound. It really is a wonderful introduction to the whole day. And from it, we shall learn, if you don't know already, a good deal more about We Are Here, Venice, and the wonderful, wonderful professional work that it's doing. Um, and also we shall learn from Jane, who is a very distinguished environmental scientist, uh, about the singular importance of the relationship between the city of Venice um, and the lagoon. I heard her give a major lecture on the subject just over a year ago, and uh, it was a revelation to me. Uh, and it makes sense, doesn't it, that if you solve the problems of the lagoon, if only we could, and we must somehow, uh, then it solves the problems of Venice uh, in many respects. So um, she lives um, in Venice and her husband Francesco is also very well known as architect, documentary maker and author. I have two of his books on the bookshelves behind me and her own publications include The Science of Saving Venice, how important that is, uh, and uh, many others which are listed on um, the short biographies. So over to Jane DeMosto, and I think you will not be disappointed, and I prophesy that we should all be very inspired by what she is telling us today at the start of this very serious conference about Venice. Jane DeMosto. Hello, everybody, wherever you are, <laughs> whatever you're doing, it's really nice to know that there are so many people with such a strong interest in Venice, not only in what Venice was, but what Venice is going to be. Um, I've prepared a little bit of a presentation that I'd like to show you, and I confess that this is a pre-recorded presentation, but um, whenever I can during the day, I'll be connecting to listen to the other talks and contribute to any discussions that there are when I can. A moment to share my screen. So, I was asked to speak today because of the work I do at We Are Here Venice, which is an independent non-profit organization dedicated to the conservation of Venice as a living city. It was founded in 2015, which is beginning to be quite a number of years ago, although there's often times when it feels just like yesterday. And we operate both as a think tank and an activist platform reinforcing connections between the best available sources of information, st stakeholders, and the local community. It's a non-profit collective of transdisciplinary professionals. Here's our core team. We have architects, administrators, scientists, artists, biologists, sociologists, a policy expert, more architects, IT people, an engineer, and so on. And the important thing is, is that even though we're nonprofit, even though we don't have a strong institutional position, we're working as hard as we can to apply the best available professional competence to addressing Venice's urgent problems. Our mission fills two spheres, rather like our 
logo that you can see here in the in the picture um, on the one hand we're dealing with the social demographic demographic issues concerning venice as a living city and on the other we're working to bring more attention and find more solutions as regards the inextricable link that there is between the urban fabric of the city and the health of the lagoon system because that's what protects venice and that's what brings venice its best possibilities for future development we collaborate with universities businesses cultural institutions and public authorities to create projects and propositions that are based on rigorous research and have concrete economic physical ecological changes associated with them that we measure according to the un agenda 2030 sustainable development goals that are illustrated around the logo of we are here venice in the picture we've many projects on the go and we try to track the things that we do by dividing them into three broad categories venice is the, the lagoon language of value and exchange of knowledge language of value contains all those things that that we do we know we don't know but also know that we need to know so it um within the category that we've called possible futures there's a lot of um research data collection and analysis of key trends that are um being observed in venice and trying to go below the changes that we see to find out what's causing them and ultimately producing reports often with a set of what we call um unsolicited propositions um the first report we wrote was called how is it for you and it's a look at the interrelationship between the living city of venice and the biennale as the biggest cultural institution in venice um, we also wrote a report that, that we were awarded a prize for um, last year by the istituto veneto and that was called whose city is it anyway both of these reports i must say are very easy to download from our website for free for everybody easily printable in pdf if you don't want to read them off the screen and um whose city and is it what anyway was one of the first attempts to really um dissect all the different interests that are um having an, an impact on on venice as a living city relative to the small and shrinking resident population. Um, at the moment, we, we've got a campaign going that's an evolution from the analysis of the human components of the city. And it's looking at the housing crisis and trying to bring attention to that. Um, via, and the project is called Solo Transitori, to do with all the um, problems of people preferring to rent to holiday makers rather than making long-term commitments and foregoing short-term economic gains by renting their homes to normal people who want to live in the city but this is something that will be dealt with really well by other speakers later in the day um i'd also like to mention that we support a couple of programs specifically designed to strengthen Venice's human capital. We um, run a, a residency, an artist residency at the Academia Galleries that was suspended due to the pandemic, but fingers crossed it's going to start again this year. And it's wonderful 
for the museum to have a living artist working with the curators and the museum staff and it's also wonderful for the city of venice to have something new going on in the museum to engage with and obviously it's an extra reason to attract more visitors which is always a welcome thing for most museums these Where's days the other thing we do is Tell an internship where... with the superintendenza which is the monuments commission in venice and it gives the best young architects a chance to get valuable experience of the monuments commission right at the beginning of their career that makes it you know which is a huge asset as their um careers progress to know what happens behind the scenes where the critical decisions are made and it also gives the superintendenza the chance to have highly qualified bright young people bringing energy to their very strict These are just some examples of some initiatives that we've done. This was a picnic in the Arsenale where um, we wanted to draw attention to how important it is to think of these huge spaces as areas in which to develop productive activities and let the city in rather than keep it closed and use it mostly for temporary events like the boat show or art exhibitions or conferences and at this event in particular it was particularly um, helpful to have some the director of the Mu museum of london come to talk about the work they're doing on the new museum and share their experience and this brings on to the area of work that we have that's called exchange of knowledge and um, it involves field trips and orientation for um, visiting students to venice as well as continuous program of conferences lectures and talks what i'm doing now also schools initiatives etc and we work a lot with um institutions that regularly bring groups of um, foreign interns to the city like the British Council during the Biennale or the Peggy Guggenheim collection that has a continuous rotation of interns and we take them out into the field give them the opportunity to participate in environmental activities like cleanups in co collaboration with other local organizations and it just means that even though they might be visitors to the city for just a number of weeks or months, they can act more like temporary residents, which is an asset to this you know, low number of people living in Venice to have extra citizen-like citizen people in the, in the local population rather than tourist-like people. And um, it also gives the people concern an opportunity to um, understand what makes Venice so special. Venice is the lagoon is the main thing I'm here to talk about today. And our work in this area is divided into four, four areas. Against giant cruise ships, which is the most obvious issue, energy futures, which are um, concerns the energy transition that is long overdue for um, water transport in Venice to make more use of hybrid propulsion, potentially hydrogen, electrical engines, and stop using filthy diesel and worse. And it's also linked to the shipping pollution that the city experiences. We're doing a lot of work in the area of ecosystem restoration on the scale of the whole lagoon. And this area of work also involves thinking about water levels, especially since 2016, when we published a book on that explains the water levels. That unfortunately is out of print, 
but if anybody wants it, they can write to me and I can let you have a PDF of that book too. Um, I mentioned earlier the inextricable link that there is between the health of this, the lagoon and protection of the built fabric of Venice. And that's because out in the lagoon, there's the salt marshes, we call them barene, which is a uniquely Venetian word for this particular kind of vegetation that's defined by its topographical relationship with water level. So it's in this intertidal zone, it's, it's a kind of vegetation that is periodically, but not too frequently, covered by the tide. And that's one thing to rem remember that's unusual is that there is a tide in the Venice Lagoon, just like there is throughout the Northern Adriatic, unlike in the rest of the Mediterranean Sea. And that's because the Adriatic is this funnel shape, you know, long, um, narrow body of water. So the fetch caused by the pull of the moon along the whole Adriatic is responsible for what means that twice a day in Venice, water level comes up and water level goes down. So something to take note of in that is that this, this um, rise and fall of water level is an important mechanism for making, guaranteeing a certain level of water quality in Venice by taking out all the waste products from the lagoon and bringing in fresh water from the sea. Um, because of modernity, I guess, because of the building of the bridge early last century connecting Venice and the mainland, for a long time, life in Venice was much was wrongly orientated towards how to get to the mainland. And so a lot of our work is about raising awareness about the importance of rethinking this intimate connection between Venice and the lagoon. So I put this slide up uh, um, from the Regatta Storica a few years ago, where we did a flash mob um, and by collaborating with many, many palaces along the Grand Canal that put these flags out on the day of the Regatta Storica. And it was a way of um, elegantly protesting the idea that, thank heavens, was then dumped of dredging another channel across the lagoon for cruise ships. And rather than say, no to more dredging for cruise ships. We, we instead put the message Venezia e Laguna, which is Venice is the lagoon. And so we, we had a strong um, hope and uh, logic told us that they would never get the permission um, following the environmental impact assessment to actually dredge the planned channel across the lagoon but even in following thoughts about what to do about the cruise ships it was important to reaffirm this this key point that whatever they do about cruise ships whatever they do about venice they have to always think about the lagoon The other thing that we do to raise awareness about the importance of the lagoon to Venice is um, on our regular post bill posting campaign, we, um, we did a whole series of posters explaining the, the individual plants that you find in the salt marsh and just with a few lines enough for people to read as they're walking past. Um, and what was interesting was the choice made by Eleonora Sovrani, the artist activist component of We're Here Venice. And she, she chose 
to use the herbarium specimens of the salt marsh plants as a warning to people that if we don't take care of the salt marsh or we'll have other or we'll have left other herbarium specimens in the natural history museum um, that was a very poignant warning because what needs to um, what you really need to know is that there's just one sixth of salt marsh left in the lagoon compared to what there was 500 years ago and um, that's not nearly enough when you think of all the functions that the salt marsh has for the well-being of venice as well as of course the the right to life that the biodiversity of of the lagoon has the biodiversity of the salt marsh has to exist since um since the um since last year actually it started in 2020 we've been collaborating with het nieuwe institute in rotterdam in the netherlands on an initiative called zoop which um i invite anybody who wants to know more about to get in touch because it's it's about developing a, a stronger legal framework for non-human life or should i say more than human life so um i guess i often overemphasize the importance of the lagoon for the for protecting venice as a city but of course the lagoon has a right to its own existence just as a as as part of nature and jumping back again <laughs> forgive me um to the human the the bit about the lagoon that's relevant to humans is the fact that the lagoon is very very powerful potentially powerful as a carbon sink i'm sure you've all heard about the climate emergency i'm sure you all know that it's important to absorb as much carbon dioxide from the atmosphere as possible through the restoration of nature and in all of this the take-home message is, is that the salt marsh in the lagoon is approximately 40 times more efficient at absorbing and storing carbon dioxide than a forest for example and that's because the um the way the plants grow and the way that the 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 dead organic matter of the plants gets covered by the sediments it slows down the decomposition of the dead vegetation in the lagoon therefore making more and more of it get sequestered underneath the layers and layers and layers of mud this shows the work that we're doing at the moment and um, for as long as we can to um, understand what of the factors governing the um, the revegetation of the salt marsh and the resilience and the strength of the salt marsh vegetation to the currents, the tides, the wind waves, the motor traffic, etc. And we're trying to put together all the available knowledge to understand how to optimize the um, design of new salt marsh in the lagoon. This shows how the new salt marsh is constructed. It um, what happens is it's not this isn't what we do. This is work that's done by the um, Proveditorato which is the, a division of the Ministry for Infrastructure, either independently or in collaboration with the Port Authority. Um, it's an incredibly costly um, activity. It requires a lot of materials, engineering, and heavy in, um, machinery. And what we're looking at is how this these activities that have been going on 
for the past 20 or 30 years can be done differently and dare I say be done a lot better. Um, here in the top left you can see a recently filled in area where the revegetation hasn't yet started. Next to it over here is some original salt marsh. So the question is how soon will the seeds and bits of vegetation from here be able to take hold in here? And are there things that can be done to um, facilitate that transitioning uh, so that it happens much quicker and pr produces a much more stable area of salt marsh? Here you can see how the edge is dry, but the middle has this puddle of water. And it's to remind us just how important it is to design these structures so that there's actually a better exchange between the in, inner areas and the outer areas. This shows the geotextile that they use to line the, the salt marsh um, enclosures. And here you can see some of the heavy machinery at work. And this is another nearby salt marsh where, in fact, the plants have started to recolonize. Water levels are another issue. More salt marsh won't exactly uh, affect the final water levels in Venice, but what they do do is slow down the currents and attenuate maybe the 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 maximum on normal tidal cycle when there's a flood condition which is caused by strong winds and that actually pushes more water into the lagoon through the inlets no amount of salt marsh can hold that back this slide shows how the number of of extreme flooding events has uh exponentially increased in the past century this is um the 1960s starts to here this is decade by decade and you see how many there were in the decade between 2010 and 2019 here but then 2020 the mobile barrier system started being tested at long last and um, nobody sh should think that Venice is, you know, out of danger because there's th they still have to finish the construction of the Mose mobile barriers. They still have to figure out a stable funding mechanism to guarantee that we will always be protected by the flood defences. They still have to iron out a lot of um, corrosion and mechanical issues with the uh, original Mose system that they started to install back in 2003. And last but not least, this slide of Piazza San Marco um, here at the top uh, reminds us that throughout the city there are areas that are more or less um, vulnerable to flooding according to the quota and St Mark's Square is one of the lowest areas of the city and it floods really often so when are we going to you know how are they going to decide when to close and when not to close the mobile barriers because closing the mobile barriers is very good for the shops and businesses and visitors to Piazza San Marco, for example, but it's a big issue for port activities. And does that, um, how can these different interests be reconciled is this kind of festering wound that the authorities still need to address directly in Venice. Um, this brings me on to uh talking about the cruise ships but i'm quickly going to check how much time i have left for this talk 
oh, I need to finish quickly. So this just shows all the crazy different situations that are going on about um, the cruise ship issue. And it's a huge problem because um, nobody is making a final decision that actually reflects the fact that there's no business for cruise ships in Venice. Venice doesn't need the cruise ships. It's the cruise ships that need Venice. Um, this was Venice. Here you can see Venice uh, until you know 2019, but it's not the just the cruise ships that are the problem. It's mass tourism that's a problem. And the other thing I want to quickly say is that it's not just cruise ships in Venice that are the problem, but our study on the global impact of the cruise industry shows that actually there's zillions of places like Venice around the world where cruises are becoming a huge problem. And finally, all of this is an issue with um, climate change and sea level rise because it's not just Venice that needs to be uh, protected, it's the whole of the area around Venice and it's the whole of the coastal areas around the world. And so to, to start the day, I just want to remind everybody that we're not here to talk about saving Venice because everybody loves Venice. We're here to talk about saving Venice as a microcosm of to show that how the solutions can work maybe on this scale and also be applied elsewhere. And so if we can save Venice, we can save so many other places around the world. I hope that's, um, that's okay. And I'm going to stop recording and wish you all a really great day. Thank you, Jane, and good morning. Lovely to see you, and thank you so much for that talk. I listened to it last night, very soon after you sent it through, and was, I feel there's so much to follow up that you've mentioned, perhaps starting, for me at any rate, with some of those published reports that you mentioned. But um, I'm very glad, I was very, very moved by one thing that you said. The lagoon has a right to its own existence as a part of nature. I think that's so important a perception. It isn't just as the complement of Venice. It is so special in its own right, in its own way. And you express that wonderfully. And to know about the value of the salt marshes more precisely in the way that you've explained it to us, I think that's such an important message too. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, Simon, have there been any questions for Jane? Uh, in in fact, no, not yet. Um, not yet. Uh, I think people are still absorbing. Um, so I can't see in the chat any specific questions. They are, for those of you who weren't with us just before nine o'clock this morning, questions are welcome in the chat. Uh, what we ask you to do is to write the word question in capital letters at the start. So we know it's a question. And if possible, to put the name of the person, uh, if you're responding to a particular speaker, to put their name as well. So I will keep looking up for that. And there might be um, some questions after we've had the next uh, talk as well. Actually, I have a question, if I might. Um, th there was much in your talk that I thought was very Ruskinian. And one aspect of Ruskinianness, if there is such a word, is not only caring about architecture and art and the cultural heritage generally, but passionately concerned about people. And that was, as has been explained by Rachel already this morning, the motivation for Ruskin to set up the Guild of St. George in 1871. Uh, and I wonder if you could say a word or two about the project you have with Bangladeshi people, because I guess very few people will know about that. And I just found it so fantastic when I, I read about it uh, some months ago from something that you sent around. Hello, everybody. Um, the project with the, um, the Bangladeshi co community is actually 
the largest non-Italian segment of the local population of the municipality of Venice. And um, we've found out about this by chance through a, a social worker that we know who works for the a cooperative that works for the Venice municipality, the Comune. And um, by talking to a few of them, we were we found out that there, there's many of them are already climate refugees. And this um, they don't really understand climate change and the fact that they're climate refugees, or the particularly because they just feel that they've been unlucky that their house has been you know flooded so many times that it's no longer livable in this particular area of Bangladesh that coincides with the particular area of um, where the Fincantieri shipyard which is in Marghera has links somehow and it explains why so many of the people that are living in Venice and working in Fincantieri come from this specific afflicted area of Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. The Bangladeshi population is a particularly invisible segment of the local population. Then they're, they're not at all well integrated to, into Venice. They're not well understood. And so we thought we could, um, it's a horrible and metaphor, but like get two pigeons with one stone. We could address the social integration of this significant component of the local population that simply cannot be ignored. They, they exist and, and we need to live together. And on the other hand, use their experiences to open up a broader and deeper dialogue about living with flooding, about addressing long-term existential challenges that are no different for Venice than they are for Bangladesh. The project, why you haven't heard so much about it is because it's, uh, it's linked to a very kind of quite complicated funding system that's run by the municipality and we have to respect their time scales for when we can start, what we need to do, et cetera, which is a new way of working for us because we're used to just responding to what needs to be done. But in this case, for bureaucratic reasons, the project is only gonna begin at the end of April. <laughs> That's because we need to wait for Ramadan to end because the way to start these dialogues is obviously through sharing a meal together. And um, if we do it in the day, more of the Bangladeshi women can participate rather than waiting until after dark. Thank you. Um, Kathleen Gonzalez has a question. Is Kathy able to ask it direct as she's a panelist? Um, she is, if you would like to, Kathy. Um, do you want to unmute? Yes, thank you for taking my question. Um, I was curious to know, Jane, if you feel that the younger generations uh, are really giving you hope for making changes in Venice. Uh, you know, students, um, artists, younger people moving back into the city. Um, do, do, should I feel some hope for the next generation to help revitalize the city and preserve the culture and the environment? Well, as the mother of four, I obviously think that young people are incredibly important to the future. And sitting next to me here is our cat who's going to have kittens. So, <laughs> but I do think that um, the young, it's, it's easy to like pass the buck. Of course, the young people are brighter, fresher, up to date. There's wonderful things that the young communities are doing in Venice, but, but it doesn't absolve our generation from needing to do everything we can because right now the young people don't have much power. They have muscles, they have ideas, but if there's nothing being done structurally to allow more young people to get their own homes in Venice, to be able to work under appropriate conditions, all these kinds of things, 
that they, they, they can't do as much as they potentially can. So it's not enough, the, the rhetoric that we hear all the time, oh, you know, it's wonderful that the young people are, are around because the old people need to provide the conditions for the young people to do what they can. Yes. I hope that's... It's wonderful. Um, yeah. I'm just going to intervene to say there are a number of questions now on the chat. So Peter, you must make a judgment as to whether you would like Jane to address these now or after Lara has spoken. But maybe I could just read them out so that people know that we've noticed oh, yes. their questions. Thanks. So from, from Teresa Temple, Jane, you mentioned a group that people staying in Venice for just a few months could join to support activities. Could you possibly give the name again, please, because she missed it? Was there a particular organization? Uh, well, no. I mean, everybody's welcome to please join We Are Here Venice. <laughs> um, but we're not big enough yet to like organize regular events. There's also the organization Venice Calls, which is um, primarily but not exclusively young people and they're the ones that organize regular cleanup so that you know just to have the chance to have a beautiful day at the beach or on the marshes while you're also picking up rubbish is is a good place to start um the way we work with with people is more like organized in groups because you know there's only so much we can do but maybe one day we will be big enough to to be able, we do know what's going on. So somebody nearer the time when they're visiting Venice can send us a email and um, we can point them in the direction of what's going on around that time. But Venice causes the, the most active community group, I would say. And there's also a group called Rialto, um, Rialto, Comitato Rialto, that organizes really wonderful visits in the area. And I'm probably forgetting something, but apologies in advance. Thank Somebody you. else on the panel might know of something better than me. Thank you. And then the two other questions, and as I say, these may be better addressed after Lara has spoken. Um, what are the current key messages you'd most like the international media to communicate? Much coverage tends to be rather doomy rather than focusing on proactive goals. By the way, says the questioner, Lisa Gerard Sharp, Jane has helped me in previous articles on Venice. Oh, okay. Hello again, Lisa. Um, and then the other question is from Jill Kirby. Do you believe you slash Venice have sufficient political support at local, regional, national level to support and save the Venetian Lagoon? No, I could have done my whole talk about lack of agency. And that's why I recommend that jo Jill Kirby reads our booklet called Whose City Is It Anyway? Because that explains the structural lack of agency of the Venetians, of the Venice Lagoon, and it's a dire problem. Regarding um, Lisa's question, the message to the media is um, is that because of this lack of agency, we need that is what most urgently needs to be addressed. If if they look after the Venetian residents, if the Venetian number of Venetian residents is in a position in which it can grow in numbers, everything else will fall into place. And at the moment, there's an initiative called Alta Tensione Abitativa, which is trying to regulate tourist accommodation supply to at least bring it in line to be in proportion with the, the number of resident populations. So if the, if the local government, if the national government does more to allow, to like fill the empty houses that there are in Venice, with workers, provide support for local businesses, local productive activities to um, reduce the emphasis on mass tourism, 
then Venice as a living city will be able to, will be better able to look after itself. But I really think we should get on with the other talks because I'm looking forward to hearing that there's still <laughs> so much to hear. I was coming to the same conclusion, but thank you because we've had a very rich opportunity to ask you questions and um, more will come up a bit later, I'm sure. In concluding, again, huge thanks for what you've been saying. I was glad you ended with that point that, as you put it, zillions of other places in the world are suffering the same problems. And I've been going to Orkney to the festival for 41 years. And the last time we went, which was in 2019, of course, uh, because there hasn't been a festival um, since, but there will be this year. Um, it was so depressing to find that the cruise companies have discovered that the capital of Orkney mainland has a very deep harbour. And the first inkling we had of it was long lines of coaches um, across the landscape carrying a lot of rather bored looking people in the direction of um, the prehistoric heritage of Orkney, which is very rich. And part of the attraction of Orkney is its wildness, its wetness, um, its um, uh, strange otherworldly qualities, which I fear are going to be ruined. And of course, so-called craft shops are popping up in order to cater for the urgent shopping needs of the visitors. It's all a terrible shame. So there are lots of other places that will be glad if um, Venice can come through this as a vibrant living city. So we'll go on now to the second talk in this group by Maria Laura Picchio Forlati, who is well the most distinguished lawyer I've ever met. Uh, and uh, um, a friend of mine in Falkland speaks about the importance of being in good conversation. And Ross and I felt so privileged because uh, Laura had us to tea, first of all, and then on our very last evening, she and her husband took us out to dinner. If you read her biography, you will see what a prolific scholar she has been as a professor of international law uh, and a specialist in European Union law, moreover. And the, her last paragraph says, again, great interest to me, that since 2010, she's been studying and promoting the legal protection of cultural heritage uh, and has edited a most important book on the subject. So, um, Laura, it is such a delight that you're part of this conference and here today. Uh, over to you. Welcome. Now, <clears throat> after having heard such interesting and uh, touching uh, reports on the problems that we all share, I feel uh, a difficulty because of my English not being up to the standard and uh, uh, only relying on the fact that I've chosen a, a small corner of a, a presentation so that I can make up for the questions that have been put to Jane Damosto, uh, whom I thank by uh, the depths of my heart because uh, she has made such a realistic um, description of the uh, effort, uh, effort uh, her association must uh, carry on, uh, carry uh, in order to face uh, the um, ambition of the targets uh, uh, they are proposing to themselves. And uh, her last reference to the attention to the Bangladesh community of workers in Porto Marghera uh, really uh, hits at strings of my heart because I was raised in Porto Marghera. And uh, I always uh, feel pain to see how far these workers that are at few kilometers out of Venice are um, from the interest of the people residing in Venice. And the idea that Jane has managed to create this bridge 
is really something that um, I share and admire uh, in the in my deepest feelings. Now I come to my topic that is I, uh, I try to keep quite concentrated because of the problems I have um, and also it, because of my difficulty to handling the new means of communication. To sit here for me is just a, a challenge, for instance. But at the same time, the interest is so great that I'm ready to go through for the whole day. Uh, what I felt is that um, we should share the initiative taken by the uh, Istituto Veneto di Scienze e Lettere d'Arte to appeal to President Draghi um, in September last in order to have him hand this appeal over to the um, C26 uh, conference in Glasgow at the end of October, early November 2021. Uh, the Istituto Veneto is a, a heritage of the French presence in Venice at the beginning of the uh, 19th century and uh, along the lines of the Institut de France uh, assembled uh, experts of the most different fields, both uh, hard sciences and uh, um, humanistic uh, uh, fields. Uh, and it is really a, a, an engine of uh, uh, sh uh, the sharing of uh, experiences at a high uh, level. And uh, it is important that uh, this um, suggestion has been made to raise the opinions of the different members in the different field as regards the problem of climate change uh, in Venice that is like uh, a death sentence for the city if it become true that by 2100, uh, the, the, the sea, uh, the average sea level can um, raise by one meter as one of the forecast uh, uh, run. Therefore, uh, we, can share the documents that have been produced by President Draghi and for wh which initiative we are waiting to know possible results. But uh, the mere reading these different stands taken in answering to two questions that uh, uh, President uh, uh, and the Council of the Institute are put to its members, namely, what do you think should be done in case this forecast comes true? And the second one, what do you think uh, to have been the cause of all the crisis for the construction of the Mose dams um, in Venice? Corruption, uh, what else? Well, uh, these short answers, on the whole, they are short answers, but read together are really enlightening about the different approaches that can be taken to the problem of the survival of Venice. But I want to start from the very first answer, that is the one by uh, Professor Piana, the proto of St. Mark, the architect, in charge of the restorations of the St. Mark Basilica, because um, it shows through photos and few sentences that the real risk in 21,000 would be for the 
walls of Venice to crumble down from inside because of salt aggression. And at that point, I think that the reminiscence of Ruskin uh, struggle for the uh, dissemination of the uh, knowledge of Venice treasures and also as part of his uh, inner feelings is very strong because the very stones of Venice that have inspired such a concentration of Ruskin's feelings and writings, well, these stones are the ones that are put at risk and not because of the grandeur of one monument or the other, but because of the basic texture of the historic center of Venice. And in face of this danger, of this risk, uh, the answers of the various and numerous members of the Institute of Veno that, that has decided to take a stand concentrate on suggesting the idea that because of the uh, lacking level of expertise in the government of the city up to now, Actually, an international organization should step in, possibly the European Union, in order to ensure the level of technical uh, uh, knowledge that need to be spread and invested in the care for the city. Well, it is at this point that as a lawyer, I have had a reaction that I want to share with you. Namely, I think that um, the idea of handing out the government of the city, once, uh, uh, as Jane the most has shown, the city itself is still so rich in sensitivity and perception of what should be done for the future. Well, I think that this is a danger we should try and exercise because um, we don't need that. Uh, the uh, idea of Europe, the influence Europe must have on the government of Venice is of a different kind. And I uh, would suggest that we turn from the European Union as a pole of attraction, rather to the more, in terms of power, modest uh, appeal that comes from the Council of Europe that is also present in Venice. Uh, the Council of Europe uh, is an you know, international organization that doesn't have in the least uh, the great uh, uh, economic strength that the European Union has, but it is made up of uh, 48 states. It has Russia in it, and uh, we are now uh, confronted with the idea of what has done Russia of the basic principles of uh, the Council of Europe, but it is the great uh, warden of the European Convention on Human Rights. And therefore, it is not a coincidence that it is the Council of Europe that has promoted the culture, uh, the Convention on the Protection, the role of, cu of cultural heritage for society. And it is uh, under the auspices of the Council of Europe that the FARO Convention has been adopted in, in 202 and uh, uh, 2002, excuse me. And therefore, uh, I would rather uh, bet on the um, intellectual. Uh, 
sentimental energy of the small community of Venetians still here to uh, receive the flood of visitors. Uh, for the, um, let us say, um, development of the uh, choices and alternatives to, to be put in action in order to save the city in its intellectual, in its sentimental, in its uh, uh, heart essence, because uh, the Venetians are still here. They are few. They are uh, a renewed population because even people that have settled down coming from abroad every right to be called Venetian. I am certainly one of them. If I told you I lived in Porto Marghera as a child, having been born from a, a Calabrese mother and a father from the market, nearly a mixture of Itali Italian origin. At the same time, I feel totally part of this Venetian core that has uh, the deposit of the traditions uh, in all the crafts, in uh, the aesthetic attention, in the um, acquaintance with the way of um, meeting, talking, exchanging from window to window, uh, because this city also offers us the chance to meet, even if we don't choose to meet. Uh, the Going around on foot or even in a Vaporetto, you meet people you, you like to. And that's why I think that the idea of expropriating from the Venetians the, the self-government of their city is a, is a great danger. I rather would bet on uh, those people that from abroad have chosen to live with us in, in Venice and, and not look for a, let us say, a professional, uh, technically advanced government from uh, other countries of the European Union. This is my uh, reaction to the uh, wonderful work done by the uh, members of the Istituto Veneto of Scienze Lettere d'Arte and something that will um, be uh, a guide for me in going on trying to to work with allies in the attention to the problem of the city. Thank you. Peter, you're muted. Yes, I am now. In I hear you. You do. Oh, good. I wasn't sure. I yes, wanted to I say. I had them, a loss. I had a loss. You, oh, Here good. I am. Here I am. Here you are. It's lovely to see you again. Uh, the great love you have for your city, and I, I think that wonderful phrase, the Venetian core, the residuum, the people who still really are Venetian and can speak for Venice. It's such an important concept that. The, the way, uh, everyone, I, I want to um, uh, organize the discussions is that after each group of talks, I will ask the speakers if they would like to comment on something the other speaker has said. So. If I may, uh, and if Jane is still here, is she? she... Yes, yes, she is. J Jane, would you like to underline some of the points that um, Laura has made and from your perspective? I'd like to not talk anymore. I'm sure oh. there's somebody else that has something to say. There will be, but- Thank, and... thank you for asking me, but it's enough. <laughs> right. Well, in that case, um, Laura, did, did you have any comment on anything that Jane said that you wanted to underline? I was, as I, I already commented on it. I was fascinated you did, didn't you? by it. And uh, yes. I, I want to add one, 
one thing that is not a, a, a question for her, but just a comfort I would give her, because I work with a small, what I call a small uh, non-governmental organization that is the Venice Foundation for Peace Research that actually has had inside mm. um, uh, the muni municipality of Venice, uh, the region of Venice, uh, two uni public universities, um, the provincia that just uh, left us immediately after there was the idea of uh, being transformed in a metropolitan city. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, we have on the paper this big public support, then we can rely only on uh, the two universities, Venice and Padua, and this is very much. Uh, we have also the Istituto Veneto Scienze Lettere d'Arti that yeah. is very faithful to us, but the difficulty of handling having re relations with the municipality of Venice has been, uh, uh, let us say, uh, leading to desperation. Mm -hmm. Therefore, um, this I, I understand perfectly from your side. Having had a, a bureaucratical, bureaucratically completely different experience, because on the paper our foundation should be a giant, but instead it's just a, a permanent frustration. Mm. So, if thing. I may say something, then yes, so via via Edinburgh, via the Guild of St George, local connections are being made because. While um, Professor Fordlati was speaking, I already wrote a note to the office to say that we must get in touch next week. So and Brilliant. I recognize the professor, but I don't think we've ever properly met. So no. Venice is tiny, but yet these connections are happening right, right here and, and now. So another reason to thank the Guild of St. George for putting this all together. And there's Anna that has something to add. But I should, I should if, I, if I can, please mm. add that, uh, unfortunately, I'm not the right person to handle, a, a, let us say, a, the, the promotional phase of a new entity big, big or, or, or tiny, because simply I, I am an anti literal artisan in the, in the intellectual field. I'm not uh, in, uh, in bound to, uh, to, in, to, to run uh, the kind of connection that are linked to the promotion of an entity in something uh, greater than it, the one you have received in your hands. I'm just uh, completely uh, out of, of, of the game because I like doing my work as an artisan would do without boasting, without it looking for support, hoping that the other will notice that you are doing a good work if it is good. And, and that's all. And this is to be the wrong person <laughs> in the wrong place in a sense. But uh, I, don't, uh, I don't charge on the others all the difficulty I have had all, over the years. But, uh, this is the reality of the frustration that has been the rule rather than the exception. Thank you. Thank you. And another question. Uh, well, actually, I think we should move on, as Jane has hinted, to, yes, to other comments and questions. But um, uh, I, we've made Anna Summers Cox a panelist, and she was, after all, one of the signatories of that important letter. So, Anna, welcome to you. And, of course, we didn't, didn't know until yesterday that you were going to be able to be with us, but here you are. So the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much indeed. Um, yeah, um, 
we, 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 um, when I was elected um, as an unworthy member, honestly, fellow of, of the Istituto Veneto, mainly because I'd been head of the Venice and Peril Fund, um, it, it, it suddenly struck me that um, it was a, a very distinguished launching pad to which to go to the head of government at a t very peculiar time and in a sense a happy time for Italian governments because uh, Draghi is an exceptionally good prime minister with great standing in Europe and it's a time in which um, large funds are coming from Europe um, to help Italy recover from the pandemic uh, in exchange for which Italy has promised to do reforms. Therefore, it's a time both of action, real action, and of uh, rethinking how to do things. Um, Draghi has made it, made, it, made it known that he is concerned about Italy and sea level rise. And as he, well, he might be, because um, the, the, the sites most at risk, the cultural sites most at risk, not to mention just uh, all many, many places where people are living um, around the Italian coastline, from sea level rise are numerous. And um, uh, Italy is almost entirely unprepared for this. Now, uh, so this appeal for Venice is actually an appeal um, which is relevant to the whole of Italy, quite apart from, as Jane says, many other places around the world. Um, what, um, what Venetians need is hope. Um, the hope, hope has gone over the years because of all the um, wrangling and the rows and the corruption and the bitterness and the fracturing of authorities. Um, and as Jane says, the citizens are not taken into account, but that is part of the Italian system in general, um, citizen, citizen involvement in 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 government is not is is not is not uh, uh, is not accepted as in, in Ang the Anglo-Saxon world. Um, I I wanted just to re reassure Professor Forlati that the plan the suggestion was not that there should become Venice in a sense should be taken over by Europe, but that um, an authority should be established such as. Uh, the Dutch established, but only late 2009, to deal with the absolutely imminent threat of sea level rise to their country. In other words, the Delta, Delta program. Um, and there too, they had to produce something that would deal with a long tradition of fractured management of, of the threat to their, their, their country. Now, of course, the Dutch have completely different um, civic traditions behind them. Um, and they also have um, the knowledge that they will die if they get their plans wrong. Um, they, but, but I can tell you that after long conversations we have had with the people of Delta Plan, they are planning for a minimum of 40 centimeters of sea level rise by 2100 and a higher level of 120. And they even have another a um, uh, little office working on a, on a level up to 2000. And uh, they, it is so integrated in all economic planning now in the Netherlands that there is no major investment, either private or public, that does not is not um, modeled to take account of these four, four various scenarios between 40 centimeters and 120 centimeters. And they are flexible, um, they uh, change according to the circumstances. They are, but they are coordinated through the Delta Plan, which responds directly to the Minister of Infrastructure, who responds directly to Parliament. There's an absolutely clear line of command and input from below. So what the appeal really is, um, and what um, we have, we did get a reaction. We got a reaction through a distinguished fellow, Ignacio Muso, um, who was told, um, um, uh, tell, 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 go, and, go and talk to the Minister of Infrastructures. And I'm hoping that, we, that this will happen because um, until such time as there is an overall plan long-term for Venice, I think that we have to say Venice is doomed. I, as things stand at the moment, Venice is doomed because there's a, one, one, one final detail. A fundamental misunderstanding about 
the barriers. Um, thank God they're now looks as they're going to work with all the problems they've had, but at least they work. But the, the barriers are not the solution. And yet that is the, the lie that somehow got propagated by the Consortio Venezia Nuova who were building it, that the, with the barriers, that was the end of the problem. The barriers are the cure for the um, acute events, shall we say, in the great sickness of Venice. They, they, they go up when there's a, a flooding event and then they come down again. But the thing that will kill Venice is the constant sea level rise. And that is not yet being planned for. Um, Jane knows very well because we, we collaborated on the big um, event in Cambridge back in 2002, do you remember? And um, at the end of three days of 120 scientists all sitting together, I remember um, um, Tom Spencer who had convened it saying, well, um, the agreement in the room is Venice needs mobile barriers, but they will give time to work out what to do next. That is 20 years ago, not one plan, official plan exists to think about what to do next, and nor is it clear whose job it is to do so. So that is what I am principally concerned about. Um, and um, anything that we can all do together to make this come about um, um, would be a great help. Thank you. Thank you, Anna, very much indeed. And I, I'm delighted to see that you've sent Laura Forlati a message proposing that you get together and have a talk because yet again, you know, um, this particular conference is bringing people together and that's a really important function of it. So great that you're here. And thanks for what you said. And I'll see if Simon has any other questions. I'm having a look at them at the same time, Simon. What do you suggest? Yes. Um, well, so there was one question which actually I see Jane has very kindly answered to directly, but I'll just I might just ask the question so everybody, in case anybody hasn't seen it, which was the question was: has there been measurable difference? and benefit to the ecology of the lagoon in the last two years due to the lower visitor numbers, especially cruise ships during the pandemic. And that came from Sally Kingsley and Jim Spriggs. And Jane very kindly answered by saying, even if there has been a measurable difference in certain parameters, the problem is the lack of structural policy change that is now permitting the over-tourism and the destruction of nature. So thank you, Jane, for responding to that. And then, um, there's a question from Sai Todd. May I ask who gives authority to the cruise ships to come into the ports, for example, in Orkney or in Venice? It seems that you wonderful guardians of Venice need to develop good deep relationships with these people in authority to get them truly on board to see how Venice is in peril. Forgive me asking this question, as I'm sure you are all doing that. But how can we do that more? Or am I missing the point completely? I love Venice and want to see it flourish as you do. Jane. He's missing the point completely because <laughs> um, the, the, you know, you need agency to be able to influence the authorities and the depth of our pockets is very different from the resources that the global cruise industry has to influence policy. And it's an incredibly um, fractious issue and difficult problem, but I just um, encourage Sai Todd to look at the Global Cruise Activist Network, Punto.com, I think it is, on the web, and where you will find um, uh, information from a huge number of different cruise destinations that are all suffering from the same problems where the industry is incredibly powerful in influencing the politics and where they can't influence the politics, they get away with a kind of lawlessness because between where the company is registered, where their headquarters are located, the fact that the ships spend most of their time on international waters means that they're quite unreachable in terms of the implementation of regulation, but we just cannot be talking about this now. There's way too much to hear from everybody who's going to speak. It needs. We can have a whole nother conference about the cruise industry. I, I, 
I'd love that, but we all need to like have a bottle of Elka Seltzer next. <laughs> I've, I've put the link uh, to the Global uh, Cruise Activist Network onto the chat for everybody. So. Yes, and Sai says he'll look into this. That's good. Excellent. Yep. There are no other questions currently outstanding that I can see. Um, no. No, I, I'm looking too. Yes. Okay. Well, um, we have had a very good session, I think. Thanks, huge thanks to both Jane and Laura. And thanks to Anna for contributing her knowledge and her perspective. And thanks all to, to all those who have asked questions. But I think it would be quite sensible to have a break because the breaks are very short. Uh, and we have to start again at 11.15 because some people will be especially joining us at 11.15, uh, we imagine, and we must therefore keep to the timetable. But 20 minutes is not a lot of time to put the kettle on and have a cup of tea or whatever it is we need to do in the short time available. So um, with hearty thanks to everyone who's contributed so far, uh, and uh, Kathleen has gone to bed because it's the middle of the night for her in California, uh, but she has after all been with us for the first uh, session. Uh, and so we'll meet again promptly, if we may, at 11.15.